How about that now, Tony? Did that come back? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Let me check this. Can you hear me now? Okay, Tony, I think that yep is meaning that you can hear me, yes? Okay, great. Yes, yes, all right. Sorry about that, guys. I am... There was a setting in the StreamYard service that I, I guess I didn't set correctly. But anyway, like I, okay, so what I was saying this whole time is that we have, we're going to be taking the AeroPress, right? Which is this, okay, we'll, we'll rewind, we'll rewind. So we have the AeroPress, which is this two, this chamber pressurized brewer, right? And we're, what I've heard on the forums is coffee forms were people talking about brewing the coffee in the air press however without using the plunger they're just they just want to brew it like kind of a drip and so I thought we'd give it a try tonight so we're going to take the paper filter put it in the filter holder lock that back in then in our vessel we're going to be brewing the coffee over ice right so brewing a hot coffee over ice and so the ice is meant we're gonna take it and use about half the volume of water we're gonna make in ice. And then the other half, we're going to brew like a pour over. And since we're doing about a 12 ounce or 350 milliliter brew, we're going to be using 24 grams of coffee. And this, of course, so we're gonna put that on top here. This is the Perla Negra from Nicaragua. And this is a coffee that we have made for us by the Mirish family out there and they do this beautiful coffee that that really has a that we use for our iced coffee at Spro. and yeah so let's level it out the grounds right? i don't know if you can see that but you can kind of see it translucently so level out the grinds place that on top and then now we're going to We're going to take our hot water. Oh. Okay, now Tony, Brian says, now I can't see you. It's playing at, what do you mean it's playing at the ceiling? The camera or the, the audio is too high? Let me know in what you're thinking. I'm not really quite understanding what you mean, playing at the ceiling. Okay, so continuing on. We're gonna take our water, we're gonna just pour it on top. And to be honest with you, I really don't know what we're supposed to do with this because this is not really the normal way you use the AeroPress. But what I'm trying to do is saturate the coffee without raising the bed too much. But as you can see, it's flowing through, right? It's flowing in and Seems like it's going, user, user error, definitely. Seems like it's going pretty fast, but I, I don't know. I really don't know. Like there's, I'm just going at this based solely on what people have talked about on these forums. Whether or not they were, I don't know. I mean, these guys just talk about it. They don't really say what they do. So I thought we'd just try it anyway and see what happens but you know you can use this kind of approach meaning to make a cold brew you can use this approach of with like a pour over or any kind of brewing device where you're taking half the volume of your water and using and making and converting oh, not converting but you you're brewing the coffee with half the volume of water that you normally would and the other half you're making up with ice right and it's by weight do it by weight don't do it by volume because you know of course ice cubes expand and then it's not it doesn't all fit together so you really shouldn't be measuring let's say like if you're doing 350 mils you don't want to be measuring 125 mils um worth of ice right you want to use 175 grams and that's the nice thing 
about water is that water is the only liquid that is equivalent in weight and volume, right? So if you want 300 milliliters of water, you just weigh 300 grams of water, and it's all the same. And that also goes with empirical measurements. So if you want um, one, po one pound of water, it's 16 ounces. Huh? Makes sense, right? OK, good. All right, so I think that's a good amount of brewing. Here we are. All right. We are going to... I guess if you want to brew coffee, like a pour over through your air press, it, it's, I guess it's good. So now we've got our coffee and it's brewed. All right, let's try it, let's try it. Let's see how it is. So it's still, you know, it's nice and cold, which is nice for this kind of nice warm day. Was this a hybrid of your U.S. AeroPress Championship winning recipe? No, this is completely different. So, Rusty, if you're just joining us, this is this is this brewing with pour-over style brewing with the AeroPress is something I've been reading on people's comments on on some of the the coffee forums, and these guys are talking about, oh, you can make great brews pour-over style by using just the bottom half of the AeroPress. And I. I I don't know why you do that, but I thought, well, this might be kind of interesting to try on the show tonight while making this, uh, what, this uh, Kyoto style, or whatever they call this style of, like, uh, iced coffee brewing. So it's 24 grams, about 350 milliliters of water, typical pour-over recipe that I would use. And it's nice, but it's light, right? Like, I think maybe... Ouch. I think it's probably better if we were to uh, maybe finer grind. I don't know how long that took. I, didn't, I forgot to measure it through the time, but yeah, so yeah, light. Eh, not bad. Not bad. Not particularly amazing or anything, but not bad. So how are you all doing tonight? What are you guys smoking? Drop that in the... Uh, in the comments below and whatever you're drinking and where you are i'm interested to know and i've made a mess here there's a lot of water everywhere now well anyway, anyway we're here tonight and it is a beautiful night here in baltimore we've had like three days of really fantastic weather cool sunny lightly warm i've really been enjoying it so Hopefully it'll continue, but I think it's going to end tomorrow. And then they say by Saturday in the 90s. Go figure. Go figure. All right. So today we've got more call, more cigars from the Tobacco Leaf in Jessup, Maryland. So if you need that, call Raul. Tonight's cigar is from Oscar Valladares. And you know when these companies like Oscar Valladares and what was the other one we did? Esteban Carrera. I don't know. Are these real guys? Like, is there really... And Esteban Carreras, and is there really an Oscar Valladares, or are these guys just enigmas created by some master? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I hear the name. You know, you hear about, a lot about the leaf by Oscar and all that. So Tony smoking Havana Soul and Lancer and plain iced tea. Plain what? No more cherry Diet Pepsi. What happened there? Plain iced tea is a good choice. You know, here's something interesting. This cello is the thinnest cellophane I've ever felt. It's really, like, you can feel the thinness. Like, it's noticeably thinner than any other cello I've ever felt. I don't know what that means. Does it mean that it doesn't work as well? Or maybe it allows more airflow through, allows it to breathe more, to age better? in the wrapper? I don't know. So this is it, the Superfly. Oh, oh Tony finished the Cherry Diet Pepsi. Oh, what a shame, what a shame. So here it is, the 
Superfly with this very large band. A very dark wrapper. Look at that. That's a nice dark wrapper. This is the Super Toro. And the MSRP on this one is ten dollars fifty cents. Comes in boxes of twenty for two ten. Of course, here in Maryland with the OTP, it's a little bit more expensive. But this has a Mexican San Andres wrapper, so it's got that that nice dark color that you normally see in these San Andres wrappers. Oh, and Bud smoking a Bayes Artis, and Pam says hello, hello, Pam. How are you? Good to see you. And then a Rusty smoking a Juarez Robusto with an Arnold Palmer. You know what? The Juarez Robusto, when did I smoke? I smoked that yesterday. Yesterday, while watching more of The Handmaid's Tale. I've been watching a lot of Handmaid. Like, it's been two seasons of Handmaid so far. And I just realized that the, set, the fourth season just concluded. So I've got, like, after this series ends, I'm going to continue on. Okay, so let's... This, this Superfly band is starting to come off, so I'm going to pull that off. It's got a really loose... Unlike the Roma Craft, this has a very loose um, adhesive. So here it is, big old, you know, whatever, big old band. Maybe too big. I don't know why you want too big. Superfly. I wonder why Superfly. All right, so let's see. So it's got this tobacco -ness, kind of sweet tobacco, right? Now this kind of color, you'd think that there'd be more of a manure kind of flavor, but there's, the man, there's not really, if there is, it's very light. It's a sweet, what I would describe as sweet tobacco, maybe a little bit of cinnamon or spices. I have tapped into the cameras in the room and the butt is set up and that's why I can see. It looks like a ladder, but that's because there's a problem with the projector. Yeah, there, see, let's see here. Uh, lock in. It's, it's, it's fairly dark. I would say it's fairly dark. Not super dark, but definitely a solid Maduro kind of, you know what this, the color is similar to? The color of this cigar in, in person is actually very similar to the color of a PG Bellicosa Maduro. That's the color of it. Okay, so let's get into the cutting. We're going to cut the cigar using the MTX cutter from Zycar. Oh. Oh, not too, not well done, not well done. All right, there we go. Now I've got the cut. Not too bad, not too bad, not too bad, not too bad. All right, let's see. Mm. The cold draw is very easy. The, the resistance is minimal, so it's a very easy draw. It's pretty thick. This is a 54 ring gauge, you know, six by 54. So it's got a good, <laughs> it's got a good bite. Eh? Eh? Uh, this is the kind of like Tony Soprano cigar, like you sit around like, you know, you see Tony and he's just kind of like, uh, uh. it's got that kind of bite to it, right? I mean, meaning the, the thickness is nice. The girth, if you like girth. All right, so we're going to light using our lighter, which is, who makes this? I'm not sure. But it has a red flame, which is kind of nice. All right, got to keep it back a little bit without getting it too... But I get impatient, so I kind of want to get closer and really kind of... Singe it. So, Rusty, you're actually outside smoking? The Juarez? 
That is a uh, that is news. So getting a little bit of this kind of like uh, like that brown that dark area that's not really it makes you think the tobacco is not lit. Mm. See, see. <laughs> ah, poor Brian, poor Brian. All right, so initial light. It's a little bit bright on the tongue. I want to say these first puffs, there's a little bit of cacao-ness to it. But it's actually rather pleasant. So we got the Mexican San Andres wrapper, right? And then there is uh, it's a binder from Honduras. And then the fillers are from the DR, Honduras, and Nicaragua. They don't really give any information beyond the country of origin, which... You know, I'm, I'm always about getting more information. So it's actually made in Honduras at Oscar Valladares' factory. And then it first was released in July 2019. So pretty good. So far, we're starting off pretty good. It's not... It's got nice flavor, right? Nice tobacco flavor. And a brightness on, on the tongue that's kind of lively and sprightly, right? But does it have, like, really distinct flavors? Not yet. Not yet. And Rusty says, I just finished and sat down to dinner. Ah, okay, you just finished. Leftovers. Oh, leftovers. Sorry, man. Sorry. Yes, but you probably have these, like, super chef leftovers. You know, like, I'm sure Thomas Keller's leftovers are kind of, like, not, like quite, not quite like mine. So tonight I had something, I, I made a, I, I, was, I was at the Lidl this morning, right, buying stuff for the shop. And as I was walking through the bread aisle, there was this ciabatta roll, and it looked really good. Like, here's the interesting thing. Some of the baked goods at Lidl is actually really quite good. I'm really, really surprised. Like, last week they had the classic baguette. So they have the French baguette, and then they have a classic baguette. The classic baguette is, so the French baguette is good. It kind of has this crumb that's very similar to like a, like a Vietnamese style baguette that's made with like rice flour. So it's got, it's got this kind of like airy, crispy interior, but with really tight um, pockets in the crumb. But the classic baguette at Lidl was actually really, really, really good. I was super surprised. Like, but they don't have that all the time, so it's a, it's a little bit frustrating. But today they had this ciabatta loaf. So I saw this ciabatta loaf, and I was like, oh, my gosh, ciabatta loaf, that looks really good. And I decided at that moment I'm going to buy the ciabatta loaf, and I'm going to buy some soft-shell crabs and make me a soft-shell crab sandwich. And this is, uh, this is what I came up with. The soft shell crab sandwich on toasted ciabatta, a little bit of mayo, bacon, lettuce, and tomato. So pretty simple, but nicely done. You know, real simple kind of preparation. Um, Pam's not paying attention. Candy Crush, Candy Crush, really? People play that still? I thought a, I thought only kids played Candy Crush. You should be playing Roblox. Roblox is the game. And then Tony's leftovers were steak and pasta, carbonara with ribeye. Oh, good, good. <laughs> That's the way to go. That's the way to go. Well, thank you, thank you. Problem is, I, I was I, I pan fried them in butter, right there. The soft shell crabs, and so by the time that I bit into them, it was still really hot because it's all like encased in a sandwich so the heat's held in. 
So I kind of burnt my the top of my palate a little bit. Oh, it's so, so <laughs> Right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it, it turned out it turned out pretty well. Uh, maybe that maybe the ciabatta could have been a little bit less toasted. It was pretty hard. You know, I just tossed it in the oven with the with the bacon at four fifty for like five minutes. I keep the I I cook I pre cook the bacon when I buy it, and then just freeze it and then just finish it when it's done when when I need to use it. But yeah, yeah, that was that was pretty good. That was that was pretty decent. That was I was surprised. And you know, what I've been thinking about lately is a lot more about frozen foods. So like, last week I made this. It was last week or just whatever it was. Re recently I made um, fried cod and shrimp with with chips, right? Well, French fries, not really chips. They were French fries. But everything was frozen. Like I bought everything frozen. The shrimp was frozen. The cod was frozen. I feel all from, all from Lidl actually. The fries were frozen, and you know that's not bad. When you thaw out the, the seafood, it's, it's not terrible. Like I, you know, kind of think that oh, it'd be terrible, but it wasn't too bad. And so I've been thinking maybe I should try that with. They have these. They have the big scallops. They look like. I don't know, sixteens. And frozen, and so I was thinking about trying that. So the cigar's going well. It's it, that bright, that acidic on the tongue is kind of more tropical now. I think that's really the dominant flavor. Which I think is interesting because, you know, you, you we always talk about the wrappers. And the wrappers, you know, you kind of think, oh, it's Mexican, Mexican San Andreas, it's going to be maybe more manure, more chocolate, more this, more that. But this one is really kind of different, so kind of nice. I was trying to see if there's something that says what the idea is behind Superfly, you know. Like, is it supposed to be about, you know, being a pimp? Because especially with this purple color and this superfly style, so it's very, it's very reminiscent of black exploitation type of movies. And like, you know, is that supposed to be the connection? And what is the, what is it supposed to be saying, you know? But it's nice, so far it's nice. So how's that Bayas Arte, Bud? Which one are you getting smoking there? The, tr the Toro or? Okay, so I'm getting a little bit of uneven burn right now. I think I'm going a little bit too fast. All right, so maybe I'm gonna slow down just to, just to here. Tony says, pimping ain't easy. And yeah, I guess it's easier when you have this cigar. <laughs> ah, Bud smoking the Toro. Excellent, excellent. So how does this go with... So this brew of the coffee, I, I think, is under, under, underdeveloped, underdeveloped. So it's got more of a, a lighter character, which I think goes very nicely with the, the brightness in the cigar. But the, the result of the brew, I think, is more of a fluke because I think it's just more about, like, if you really wanted to explore and really get into the AeroPress as a pour-over style brew, you'd really have to, you know, do some more testing with it, meaning you, you brew a few more, adjust the grind, watch your brew times, and then really, you know, dial it in.
But so far, the draw has been is really nice. Actually, the draw is excellent. I'd say that's this is like amazing draw. And it's easy. It's smooth. The flavor is nice. Let's see what, let's see what some of our friends. Oh, Pam says pimping is easy on the right mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> says the the queen of the tot swap. Yeah, if you guys are watching, you ever want to do tot swap and you need a consultant to help you and figure out how to do tot swap, you should call Pam because she knows tot swap like nobody else. All right, let's have a look here. Let's see what our friends at... Let's see what our friends at Half Wheel have to say about it. Let's see, let's see. Heavy dose of chocolate, pre-light, I didn't really get any of that. Nacho light, salty corn sensation. Oh, here it is. Superfly begins with earthiness, peanut butter, and almost nacho like I guess I can see that saltiness peanut butter no medium full with sharp contrast yeah 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 no oh, so Pam has just called me and said that she is not with toss up oh sorry what was if you need to work with some kind of organization to sell all of your old stuff and move it to new new places then you should call Pam not tots well. forget those guys they suck So it says the first third of this superfly is similarly without chocolate, instead of providing a good dose earthiness, orange peel. Okay, so you, I would I would I could see that orange peel because we're talking about that acidity, right? Retro heels are fruitiness, oatmeal, some leather. I'm not really doing any retro healing, so I can't really speak to that. And a flavor that reminds you of tobacco sweating. I mean, yeah, to me it's just nice tobacco, sweet tobacco. And some kind of bright acidity on the on the palate, but nothing nothing terribly in depth. Or there's not like some cigars you get these really distinct flavors. This is just kind of actually it's just nice, enjoyable tobacco tobacco style. All right, so that's what they're saying. What about these guys here at Cigar Dojo? Let's see what they're thinking. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, toast the foot. As, as the cigar begins to smoke, the first few puffs coat the palate with rich chocolate sweetness. Yeah, not the, I didn't get the chocolate. Sweet tobacco, yes. Chocolate, I didn't really taste that. Hints of fig and dark cherry. Yeah, I guess you could say that. I guess, sure, why not? That, that brightness, you know. The retrohale is sand spice. Sand spice, though. And is instead of full of earthiness. Okay, okay. So it progresses with active change of sweetness to delightful notes of peanuts, nutmeg, and leather. Okay, we haven't had that peanuts. I mean, I'm, I, that's two reviewers talking about peanuts, so maybe, maybe I'm the one that doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, blind man, blind man's puff. What do they say? So first third, thick black pepper and earth. What? What? Black pepper and earth? Holy, get crazy. Through the nose, cream and also chocolate. Mmm, I don't know about that. Leather and sweet floral also present nice and complex. Cigars, medium strength. Are we in the right cigar? Yeah, same cigar. <laughs> that was from their John A. guy. And then into the second portion of the pepper has... Oh, a second. Let's go back first. Initial flavors are quite flavorful and jam-packed with spicy pepper and peat. Spicy pepper and peat. Are we smoking the same cigar? Because there's no pepper. There's not that... So, I don't know. The, okay, I'm not gonna forget that one. We're gonna, we'll come back to that later. How about cigar? How about Will? What does Will Cooper have to say? So let's see. Will had the Super Chroma. Classic wood, cedar, black pepper, citrus, natural tobacco, and cream. Okay, the citrus. Uh, early on, citrus and natural tobacco became the primary notes. There was a slight acidic quality. Yes, yes. 
Yeah, okay, so we've got three reviewers kind of agreeing on the same thing, but these guys have blind pants. Well, I don't know what they're smoking. Maybe somebody switched their cigar because I don't know where the, the black pepper that they're talking about is. But all good, all good, you know, we're just checking it out. It's easy smoking, I must say. It's really quite, quite nice. So you guys been watching anything lately? Anything interesting? What did I watch this week? Well, I, as you know, I've been watching a lot of Handmaid's Tale, but I've been trying to keep up with the, uh, oh, the, the Bad Batch from Star Wars. I don't know if I saw that yet. Like, I mean, the last one. Oh, George is back. Hey, George, good to see you. Greetings from 92nd Street Beach in Ocean City. On the beach, cigar, light with the light. Be nice. Nice. What's your, what are you smoking? Did you pick it up or brought, did you pick it up from one of the local shops or did you bring it with you? The last couple of times I've been to Ocean City, I've been going to that, um, is it Senior Cigars that has the two locations, the one down by 33rd Street and the one that's up by like 145th? And if you're at 92nd Street, more importantly, did you go to Bull on the Beach? These are questions that I, you know, I've been trying to get down to Ocean City all, all the last, all, all of 2021, I've been trying to go there. Like, I've been telling my friend, like, so one of my friends, she, her family runs Trimpers, right? The, the rides at the boardwalk. And so she was, she, she's been there for, during the whole pandemic. And, you know, she's actually really into food. And that's what she, she actually publishes this, uh, this, this uh, magazine called Star Chefs. And, and the rest of you know her, Antoinette. So Antoinette's family is from Maryland. She, cause she grew up here in Baltimore, went to high school. She went to Delaney High School here in, in Timonium. And I, I, I don't know, she, she, during the pandemic, she, was, she ended up running Trimper Rides or something like that. And so they built this food court that they were gonna open for this summer. So she's been trying to get me to come down and see it. And then one of my good friends was living down there and so I was trying to go to visit, and I really wanted to get some French fries from Thrasher's. But every time I was trying to get down there and make plans, it was always interrupted. So I haven't been there yet. I haven't been there since November. I went there in November to, to shoot a video down there. Shoot a video that I still haven't finished. Sometimes these videos take months. like. The, the series that's out now called Coffee um, Wonderland. It's a six part series that has been running now for four weeks. And I actually shot that in September of 2020. And so only now is it coming out. Oh, the La Rovador, excellent. I don't, actually, I'm not familiar with that. I wonder what that is, let me see. La Rovador, cigar. Put that back up here. Let's see. La Rovador. Oh, uh oh. Is it La Ro Trovador, baby? That's what it says on here. Oh, the PDR L Trovador is that the one? No, PDR makes good makes. They make good cigars. Actually, Abe just called me. Well, actually, he called me a. A couple weeks ago, he was. He called me up. And he was like, "Hey, man," I was like, "What's going on, dude? <laughs> Everything all right?" He's like, "Oh yeah, I just wanted to call and see how you're doing." Oh, okay, cool. I saw it right on. I'm not sure if he was going to the uh, to the PCA show next week, or in two weeks. Had Thrashers today. No bull on the beach. Oh, Thrashers is good. I really would like to have Thrashers. Just for the taste, you know. Just for the taste. <laughs> no worries. No worries. You're on the beach. You join a cigar. It's all right to make t spelling mistakes. Actually, I think that my, on my phone, the spell check works against me. Like, it will correct things that I'm... It'll try to correct words that I'm trying to spell a certain way. But then, like, when I end up posting something that, that has a, a regular, a normal word, 
it will misspell that, and I look like a moron. It's like, oh, God. How can I make an argument on the Internet if my grammar and, like, spelling is off? You know? It's terrible. Yeah, and Siri just doesn't talk to me. Siri won't even listen to what I have to say. And then Buddy's now on to the Illusione MJ-12. That's a good cigar. Those guys make nice cigars. So here it is where we're rolling. It's getting a little bit wobbly. Oh, look, it's breaking right there. Look at that. It's breaking. Oh, man. I should tap it out. I would tap it out. Oh, oh. Before, I just tilted it over and it fell out. All right, look at that. Look at that. Crazy. All right, now I'm going to tap it to make sure. I, all right, there we go. There we go. It's smoking well. I, I gotta say, this is really, really nice. The machines are taking over. You know, on the NPR this morning, I was driving into work, and they had, they had this article, they had this report where they were talking about how, okay, how we can how we can detect planets in other distant solar systems, right? And how we do that is that we, we look at these stars and we look for aberrations in the light, right? So distortions in the light as we're looking at them. And that is supposed to mean that the, the, the planet is passing in front like an eclipse, right? Essentially an eclipse, right? So this aberration tells us that that's, that star has a planet or, or multiple planets. And that's how we identify stars because, you know, we can't see them because our telescopes aren't that good. And so here's the thing. So like I was listening to that, I was like, that just... And so we're trying to... F the, oh, the article was about trying to figure out what stars can see our planet. Like what angle of stars can see our planet making these aberrations in our sun's trajectory. And I was like, oh, just like, that's just fascinating. So it made me think about like, okay, so if we are... Okay, so, so the, the, the stars are what, millions of miles away. Millions, right? Millions and millions. And it takes a long time for that light to reach us. So these people, like, so let's presume that there's a, a species out there that can actually, from their planet, look at our planet with a granularity that they can actually see people on the ground, right? They can see our civilization. They can see us. And they're millions of miles away, maybe millions of years away. Long after we've met our demise, they're still going to be watching us. Like reruns. So, the, the nice thing about Spro is that since we're in Hamden, which is next to Hopkins, a lot of my guests are astrophysicists, astronomers, people involved with science and especially with the Hub and Webble telescopes. So one of the girls comes in today and she's, she's an astronomer with, 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 she's with the web. No, no, she's with Hubble. The other girl yesterday was with, is with Webb. And, and, I, and I brought this up to her, I said, because I'm always just like fascinated by this. And she's like, well, you know, the nearest planet is 150,000 light years. And I was like, whoa, 150,000 light years. Okay, so made me think our species, humanity, humans, homo sapiens, has been around for what, 150, 200,000 years maybe so far? Let's say we can last another 300,000. Let's say we can last another... Let's say we can leave last another 100,000 years and make it to 300,000 years before our species is wiped out by whatever reason. So our existence of, of Homo sapiens and humanity is 300,000 years long. Well, the nearest planet is 150,000 light years away. So for that light to travel, it'll take 150,000 years. So we may never get to see, or, or, or maybe the species that, so if we presume that species around the, the universe 
last in similar time, 300,000 years. Will we ever get to see anyone? And if we do, or if they do, we'll be long gone, or they'll be long gone. This is kind of the existentialism that I think about sometimes. Like, you know, I mean, when I first, when I was watching that, uh, that deep space picture that shows all the, the solar system, the galaxies, millions of galaxies in that picture that was from the darkest point of the sky. You know, I talked to, talk to these people about it. And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's pretty amazing. And I'm like, God, what the heck? I just don't understand. These things are so far away. And they're, and they're little specks, but they're these massive galaxies, millions of them. It's almost like it's a construct. But that's what I, that, that's what I was thinking about today. It's, it's very, it's very strange, very strange. Oh, coffee's nice and cold. It's actually quite enjoyable to have cold coffee today. So the cigar is working well. We're really into the second third now. And it's, it's, man, it's smoking nicely. Still with the same kind of leathery tobacco-ness. It's like maybe a little more leather than in tobacco. Tobacco is still on the sweet side. And there's still this bright acidicness to it. It hasn't really changed, but it, it it's, it's so far, it's, it's, it's really relatively static as far as the flavor profile, but it's still quite nice. So have you guys been following Loki? I know the new episode just dropped today, or yesterday. I haven't, I just haven't seen it yet, but I've been enjoying it. Last week's episode was, was pretty interesting. You know, they introduced the, uh, the variant Loki, which was quite interesting. I think a lot of people are excited about it. I me, mean, it doesn't really, doesn't really make any difference to me. If we believe men and black planets are nothing but alien children, that could be, that could be. Our whole existence is, you know, this is a little marble. They will, <laughs> exactly. Exactly, but if we if they if they look at it from another angle, right, they'll totally see us. At that angle, yeah, they won't see us. And here's the thing: you know, actually, that someone pointed this out to me the other day. It was a really great thing. I thought they were like, you know, if you really believe the Earth is, it's like if you believe the Earth is flat, don't you think that capitalism would prove it? That if the Earth was flat. Capitalists would have built visitor centers at the edge of the earth. Hmm? I think that's a fair point. Oh, a friend of mine just texted me. February 3rd, 2022, at the Anthem in DC, the duo Erasure is going to be playing a show and can you believe this? You know, like they had, they had, what was it? They had an article the other day, or some, one of my friends posted the other day about Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen playing at like some arena. And not a very big one. $750 for a ticket. Oh, God, $750. I thought that $250 for U2 was expensive. I didn't go to that. That was too expensive. But this one, Erasure, $69.50. Sixty-nine fifty for general admission. Of course, that means you have to stand. I don't want to be standing. I want to be sitting. I want to have a place to sit. Yeah, what are these? You know, it's not like we're nineteen anymore. We're all old. Erasure's old. The fans are old. Plus, you know, is it really that exciting to go to a concert when everyone's old? Like the last concert I went to, like the last Duran Duran concert I went to was ten years ago. And. uh Everyone's old. Everyone's old. I don't want to go. To, I don't want to go to concert. Everyone's old. 
if I gotta be old now, I wanna be the old guy at the club. Huh? Huh? That's what I wanna be. Oh, speaking of which, this reminds me, you guys might be interested in this. Let me pull it up here. So they just announced, uh, um, Focus Features just announced that they're going to be releasing a movie about Andy Bourdain. And Bourdain, it's called Roadrunner. It's about him. I don't know what it's about. I mean, I don't know what the, I don't know what the, I don't, I don't know what it's all about. But it's about him. And so, oh, it, it came out today. I, I didn't do anything about it. Anyway, so here it is, Roadrunner. And they're doing a Brasserie Le Hall pop-up in New York City, July 9th through 11th. And it tickets went on sale, or were, were on sale today. They probably sold out. Let, let's see, let's see. Did they sell out? So on June 24th, 10 a.m., Tickets go on sale to the public. I'm sure they're sold out. Maybe yeah, sold out, sold out. Yeah. Why am I not surprised? Hmm, sold out also. Oof, bastards. Sunday. How about Sunday? Give me tickets. No, no, you can't get that either. All right, anyway, so they're all sold out, so it doesn't really matter. But Rusty brought this up to me yesterday. He's like, hey, man, did you see this? I was like, oh, no. But as you can see here, the, here's the... the the pop-up, and you get $95 plus tax and fees, so you're paying well over 100 what, 120 bucks for French onion soup, steak frites, and a choice of dessert. I don't, re you know, it's been a while since I've been to Le Hall, but I don't remember it costing that much. Like, that's expensive. Like, Le Hall was, you know, I think for that meal, in the old days, what the and so the steak frites is actually the steak au poivre, right? And which is the pepper steak, where they take the black pepper and they put tons of black pepper and then they grill it, which is kind of actually on, on. That was my least favorite steak. Oh, here's what he's saying. I can't fathom. Exactly, exactly. It seems quite expensive. And especially, it's it's what? Let me. What is it? I didn't really read everything, but I think it's being held at a restaurant. Oh no. It's being held in the old restaurant? What? All right, maybe that's worth it. To go back into the old Park Avenue restaurant? That might have been cool. But the thing is, is like, you know, if they did the pop-up and they had the menu, or at least a number of the menu, that would have been really, really compelling. That would have been like, okay, okay, I gotta go, because I really like their, I really like their food. And, and New York's menu was very different than DC's menu. Like, they had more options. And, you know, but, but yeah, 65, uh, 95 bucks, uh, it's $65. Okay, that's probably about right. But 95? I mean, we used to go pretty much weekly at times to DC. And if it was $95 for me, we would not be going there that often. But if it's, it seems like it's being held in the old restaurant, that's, that's kind of cool. That would be kind of cool. So Rusty's saying, I wonder if the market of a beef price country, maybe, but God, $95? I mean, what's the dessert? Souffle? I don't know. I mean, like if I, if I if for me, this is the best dessert that they had, and it was only at New York, at the Park Avenue one that I remember was they had this coconut, I had one time I went there and I was like, oh, I'll have coconut, I felt in the mood for coconut ice cream. And man, it was the best coconut ice cream I've ever had. It was super delicious. Like, I, I always thought about that. Like, they never had it at DC, so I was always kind of disappointed after that moment. But I did like the, the New York one, they had the, uh, the butchery in the front, so you could get like you know the nice the French style cuts. It's too bad that none of the rest, none of the four restaurants remain. Like that was really, I think they got into tax problems, but such a good time there, such a good time. 
And back in the day, you could smoke cigars at the bar. Pam is out. All right, bye, Pam. Have a good night. Yeah, so we're going pretty well, right? We're, we're getting towards the end of the second third. And it's only 9 o'clock, so I'm going pretty fast on this one. But back to Bourdain, you know, if you, if you ever get the Lay Hall cookbook, I think that's, that's worth it getting. That's a really nice, nicely done book. Simple recipe, you know, basic recipes. No, nothing too fancy, nothing too difficult. You know, the interesting thing, like here in, here in, in the area in D.C., there were a lot of my, some of my friends were really about a place called Bistro de Quan, which is on um, DuPont Circle. And Bistro de Quan is quite good. But they were always like, oh, it's better than Lehal. I was like, no, it's not better than Lehal. Nothing was better than Lehal. Lehal was, it wasn't, it wasn't fancy. Like, you can go now to the Le Diplomat in D.C. And Le Diplomat is very nice. It's a brasserie, but it's very nice. Like, you'll spend... You'll spend that $95 easily. But it just didn't have that. There's a unctuousness, an oomph that Le Hall had. Because, I think because of its simplicity that was just so like, like it was never too, it was never too refined. It was never too cute, too beautiful, right? It was just kind of like down home cooking. It reminds me of this place that I went to in Paris that's close to the hotel I stay in. Actually, it's just down the street on, on Rue d'Amalie. And I don't even remember the name, but I remember going by it and I remember eating there and like I would get this um, oh no. The Blanquette du Vaux. And the Blanquette du Vaux that they made was just this beautifully simple dish, rustic, nothing too fancy, nothing too Nothing too pretentious, but just down home. Oh, that was the Le Hall type of food, for me at least. I wish there was more places like, like that, that kind of Le Hall, that kind of French brasserie, simple, not too fussy place to eat. That would allow us to have cigars. That would be great. Go back to my Anglais. Anglais and frites with a little bit of salad and a cigar. Oh, that would be lovely. So what has been happening? I've, I've been thinking about this. One of my customers, one of my regulars, came in yesterday, and he was telling me about this book. And it's a book called Stuff White People Like. But it was, the book wasn't as, as significant as our conversation. And he was talking about how there's a question, there was something that, that it wasn't phrased exactly like this, but it was about, but the, the, the underlying thing, underlying message was, do, do African Americans drink gourmet coffee, especially coffee? And it kind of got me thinking that I thought that would be an interesting topic to explore for one of the videos for the channel, you know, like, because, you know, and as I read some articles after that, online, it does seem like, you know, African Americans are underrepresented or, or whatever in, in specialty coffee. Because I think about my, I think about in my circles, in the coffee business, you know, there's very few African Americans or very few African, you know, in the Western coffee world, of course, but very, very few. Like the one that I can think of is this one girl, she's from the United Kingdom. She's black. Um, oh, of course, there's Chris, the, the owner of um, Sophomore here in Baltimore. But I, as I think about it, there really hasn't been too many in the, in the circles that I've seen. So I thought that'd be an interesting, that might be something to explore. I'm gonna talk to some friends about it and, and see if there's any kind of you know, storyline to be told. But that might be something to work on for, for the fall.
Yeah, I am really just sucking this cigar down. Just going at it hard. What else have we, what have you guys been smoking this week? Yesterday I smoked the Juarez, which I enjoyed. I enjoyed that Rusty, I, and the Juarez was nice. And I also smoked the, the Mil Diaz Edmundo, which is their Robusto shape. And what else have I smoked this week? Oh, I had the, uh, the Intemperance. Which Intemperance was that? Not the Intemperance, but Aquitaine. That was really nice. Hmm. Yeah, this cigar is still on the bright. It's, it's a bright cigar. Bright and acidic. Definitely no pepper. Black pepper that that, that the guys at um, Blind Man's Puff, I get none of that. Like, right now there's a little bit of harshness starting to develop. Maybe a slight spiciness on kind of the back part of the top of the tongue. Also, it's maybe it's a condition that I'm smoking a little bit faster. The heat is starting to build. So I'm going to take a moment. Take a moment to slow down. And let it cool down. I, I, guess, I guess I would say that I'm really enjoying this because I'm, I am smoking on it pretty heavily. So how about you guys? What have you smoked? Anything really interesting this week? Oh, you know what I had recently? So I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but I haven't really been heavy on Arturo Fuente cigars for quite a while. And a friend of mine gave me this Lost City. Oh, I guess I did mention that last week. But yeah, I had that Lost City uh, Bellicoso that was actually really, really solid. Like, surprisingly so. That I really enjoyed it. Really, I have, but I haven't smoked that. I didn't smoke it. What did I smoke this week? Let's see here. What does my little file say? No, oh, it was a Neanderthal KFG. That's what I tried this week. That was good. And Tony says he had the Tatoe Black Label Casadores. Oh, nice, nice. Neanderthal HS, Mil Diaz Edmundo. Now there's that Edmundo again. And La Antiquidad. Oh, you know, I haven't tried the La Antiquidad. That sounds interesting. I've been trying to ride my bicycle more. And so I've been going out. I've managed to go out twice each week for the last, like, three weeks. And I've just been going on a simple trail nearby here that uh, that's relatively flat because, you know, I'm just not up to the challenge of terrain. <laughs> but, you know, I've been doing short rides, maybe like four or five miles at the most. What am I doing here? Let's see. Let me see here. Yeah, yeah. I'm just under five miles each time. And so trying to build up to longer distances, right? So... I basically go up the trail. So I use this thing called the NCR trail and the Fausto Calibra. I saw that picture that you posted about that, Tony. With the, I was wondering which one you were smoking. Is that new, the Fausto? Is that the Fausto? The Fausto is the new Calibra, right? Oh, and remind, which reminds me, if you're, uh, if you're a member of the Saints and Sinners Club, renewal time is now. So you should renew. Um, there should be an email that, that tells you to renew. I just got my renewal. Oh, and Rusty's picking up a Costal Calibre tomorrow. So I guess these are the new ones. Okay, good, good. Oh, yes, they are. Oh, and Bud, you've been doing the answer with Barry, too? Excellent, excellent. I've been going out. 
I've been trying to do Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday and Friday. I have not been successful at Mondays, mainly because last Monday was raining pretty darn hard. I thought about going on Tuesday because, you know, right around 7, it was all clear. But, you know, I was kind of wrapped up with something else. Actually, I was wrapped up with more Handmaid's Tale. And then um, yesterday I went out. So I t yesterday was really packed. Like when I got there, about 6.30, I was like, oh, my gosh, there's all these cars. There are cars on the road. And then as I'm starting out, like here's the thing. So yesterday was a beautiful day, right? So I'm sitting here. I, I, got, I finished work at the shop, came to the roastery. And I was like, oh, you know, it's a beautiful day. It's too beautiful to work. So I just decided I'm going to sit down, have a cigar or two, watch more Handmaid's Tale. So I watched like three episodes, like three hours worth of Handmaid's Tale. And I said, you know what? It's a beautiful day. I should have a drink. So I had some of the Diplomatico on the rocks. And uh, yeah, it was nice. And then I finally went out at like 6.30. Man, the, the day drinking was not a good idea. Like, I could feel like, like, I wasn't, I couldn't feel the drink, because really all I had was like maybe half an ounce, an ounce at the most. But that was enough to like, I could feel like, oh, this is, I should, I should probably not have had anything to drink at all. Just because it, it wasn't, you just don't feel like you're at, at a peak, at your optimum, right? Like, you don't feel right. So I was kind of discombobulated as I started. Plus, all these people were on the trail, and like, man, it was like, you go, and then you gotta stop or slow down. And then I couldn't really, like, at first, for the first, like, quarter mile, I really couldn't get a groove, so it was like, I, I would just, like, like one, at one point, the clips locked in, and then I almost had to stop, so I was like, oh, God, I'm gonna wreck. But I didn't, luckily. And, uh, yeah, so uh, it was all right. But don't day drink before you ride. It just doesn't, you just don't, you just don't ride as well. Like, I just didn't ride as well, right? I did get to have, I did finally get some glasses. So I finally went this week and I bought these Tifosi glasses from REI. REI mainly because you get the, uh, if you remember at REI, you get that refund at the end of the year with the dividend. So, yeah, so these are clear, and these, these ones, they have this, this like, autofocus feature, which, or auto-shading feature, so if it's really bright, it's supposed to get tinted, but they're clear, so they're, and they're not getting that tinted, it's not like sun sunglasses, but they're, they're pretty wide, and you kind of get this bono kind of look, but they work, they work really well, it was really nice, it was really nice. So Rust, you know, Tony says the Rust, they are tasty, the, the Culebra, the Fausto. Oh, Nick, welcome. How are you doing? Thanks for watching. I watched your views with Mr. Skase. What surprised me is that you guys never stirred your espressos. Why is that? I'm thinking in terms of salami. You know, I'm not sure what the salami shot is. Um, why don't we stir our espresso? Hmm. You know, I, I've, I've done both over the years, right? Stirring and non-stirring. I tend not to stir because I'm interested to, to see the layering of the flavor in the espresso. So while a lot of people that stir want to get that homogenization of the flavors throughout their drink, I'm interested to see how the, the, the drink will change and how the layers taste. And that's, that's really the basic concept behind it. I know a lot of guys that are on the forums will read and, and, and they'll watch a lot of what James has to say. And I know James is, is a big proponent of, uh, of the stirring. Um, yeah, it's something that... that Maybe we'll do once in a while. I tend not to. I just kind of drink. And also, most of the time that I'm drinking espresso, I guess I'm shooting it. You know, maybe two or three sips and it's done. But there's some more coming. So the Saturday's episode is a, is a little bit more, is another, it's another long one. Like, I've been kind of like trying to figure out if, if I've been making them too long. Like, they're running almost an hour. But uh, I think that it's if for those people that are really in, that are really into it, that really want to like get deeper into it, I think that that that's an audience that's willing to like check it out and stay with it. Plus, there's a lot. I think there's a lot of nice divergent type of discussions about different aspects of espresso and coffee and theory in the industry. 
And then when you pull a shot and swap out the cup every five seconds to get the layers, layers. oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. So you know what? Actually, interesting enough, there's a guy from the old form. So back in the old days, let me, let me grab this for a second. All right, so one of the old guys in, in the, the espresso coffee world is a guy by the name of Andy Schechter. And Andy owns a company in uh, upstate New York called Soy Boy, where he makes tofu products. And Andy's been, Andy was always very much into, into different ways of, of understanding it. So years ago, he created this, this thing in this box. And um, I use it every blue moon. But I think it's quite interesting. So what it is, is basically this Delrin, Mill Delrin tray. And then you place these Libby shot glasses in the tray. And as you pull the shot, you move it. So there's six of them. So you kind of get, you know, two, two, and two, right, for the double spouts. Or you could do, you could really break it down into the six segments. Um, so we use, you know, I'll use this every blue moon to get that kind of effect that you're asking about the salami shot. Right, let, me, let me put this away now. Oh, that's, that's cool. Okay, I didn't know it was called salami. I really enjoyed them. It seems like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, uh, Greg is a really, really good guy. I've known Greg since, uh, since he started developing this case. So, when Greg started developing this case, it must have been like 2003 or so. And um, my mentor in the business is a guy named John Sanders, who at the time owned a place called Heinz Public Market Coffee in Seattle. And uh, John was really involved with, with Greg and, and as, as Greg was developing this case device. And so that's really where I got to know Greg. And um, yeah, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. And the caffeine thing, you know, yeah, I just do, a, I've done a lot of caffeine. <laughs> it's not always really good. Like, for example, I mean, part of it's because I do a lot of judging in, um, for competition. So I do a lot of competition judging. I do a lot of coffee cupping as well. So the, you kind of get this tolerance of, of taking the shots. Like, Greg, as you noticed in the video, he couldn't keep up. After a while, he actually stops drinking. I don't know if that happened in episode four that's out of, or if in episode five, like in episode five, I don't think he drinks at all. But, um, yeah, like, for example, let's say in a, in a typical, like, barista competition that we're running, as the head judge, you know, I taste all the drinks. So we have four judges on a panel that taste the drinks, and the barista competitor will make each judge a drink. So there are three rounds of drinks. So, so espresso flight, a milk drink flight, and then a signature drink flight. And so each of the judges just tastes the coffee that's served to them. But as a head judge, I taste every one just so that I have an understanding of where, where that coffee might be scoring so that when we discuss about the, the scoring after the competitor is finished, I'll have a better idea of what each judge tasted. So, yeah, you just kind of build up a, a tolerance for it after a while. And, But I appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for coming in. And thanks for watching the videos. You know, let your friends know. <laughs> and subscribe. You know, oh, you, know all, you know all that stuff that YouTubers tell you. But Nick, I'm also interested to know, like, in the coffee YouTube world, who do you follow? Who do you like? And maybe why you, why you like them. What, do they, what are the things that they're doing that, that you find appealing? That would be interesting to know. Because I'm always trying to figure out what would be nice and videos that people are interested in, in learning about. Like one of my good friends, uh, Wolfram Sorg, he's the former barista champion of Germany, and he owns a company called Backyard Coffee in uh, Frankfurt. And he also has some locations of that backyard in, uh, Seoul, or in, in South Korea. And him and I have been trying to figure out what to collaborate on. Like, I just, actually, I just had this... Uh, I just had the idea that I haven't really run by him yet, but basically, the idea, I was watching this guy on YouTube who I follow once in a while called, my name is Andong, 
and he's this German guy based in Berlin. And he, was, he did a video recently within the last like week or so where he's, he goes down to Bad Homburg, and, which is right outside of Frankfurt, because he's, he's doing this video, he's doing this thing about seltzer water. And, and he's going to these natural springs for the seltzer water. And I thought, oh, and maybe that could be something to explore, like the next time I'm in Frankfurt. Because usually I get to Frankfurt like once or twice a year because of the way that our flights for the competitions work. So I'm, I got to I got to talk to Wolfram about that. But yeah, I'd love to know what you think about what you find interesting and uh, and who you like. So here we are. We're going along to the final third. We're in the final third. Well, into the final third now, and it's. It's very consistent. This Superfly by Oscar Valladares is very, very consistent. Very pleasant, very enjoyable. The draw is still just about perfect. Good amount of smoke, good flavor. You know, which makes me think, okay, so what about these guys? What are they saying? Oh, let's go to the other one. What are they saying about their scoring? Like, you know, we know Half Wheel likes to score. So let's see. 88. Well, huh, 88. I'm not entirely sure what making what three Superflies, solid scores on flaws, but also one that shows some potential of being a lot better. Hmm. Well, I mean, at least in this case, I'm not entirely sure what to make of after smoking three Superflies, solid scar with some flaws, but also one that shows potential of being a lot better. Yeah, I guess what he's saying would be very ap applicable to the score that he's giving. You know, it's not the it's it's under ninety, so it's not one of those that's it's not so great. But then it's so Cigar Dojo tells uh, ninety one percent complexity throughout the textbook draw, unique retro hail. Cons for them was frequent touch ups and flaky ash. Yeah, the ash is slightly flaky. Like if I look at my desk here, there's definitely ash. Like spread upon the desk but um yeah 91 I, I you know i'm actually kind of inclined to to go along with these with them blind man's puff 94 oh 94 well that's really really <laughs> that's really let's see here 94 90 90 oh 98 in the burn 98 in the draw wow well yeah you know draw and burn i mean it's been relatively perfect you know there's been a little bit of the the offness, you know, that little bit of earlier on, maybe when I smoke it too hard. Okay, okay, 94. That's, this is a good reason for 92, 91. Okay, that, these are good reasons for like 94. Okay, I can go along with that. Although our tasty notes are completely different. Do these guys give a, oh, 89 for, 89 from the guys from, oh, William Cooper gives us 89 and Let's see what Will has to say. Isn't going to deliver anything in terms of radical flavor profile. No, it's not a, oh yeah, well this is the connected shit. Okay, we can't really look at that because that's not the same cigar. It's a different cigar. Yeah, okay, okay, so yeah, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, I would say, yeah, nine, at least 92. Mainly because I, 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 am, I will say that I am, these guys make a very good argument for you know, the burn and the draw were excellent. Construction is very, very, very good. The flavor is nice. And the medium, yeah, I would say medium, but it's not terribly complex. It's, but it's very consistent. Everything's very consistent. So, yeah, okay. All right, let's go back to, the, to what everyone has to say. So Nick says, I enjoy the envelope being pushed. The decent guys are interesting. Hoffman, Baca, Artisti in Australia. Oh, I haven't seen Artisti. And also Scott Rayo. Oh, Scott's good. Yes, Scott's good. Yeah, those guys are always good. Like when I see pictures of like James's place now, Square Mall, I remember when he first started, when he first opened Square Mall, I was in London. And they were in this, under this railway, real tiny place. <laughs> and even Chris, you know, now that he's got uh, Cat Cloud, that's a fun place. I, went, I did go visit Cat and Cloud a couple of years back when I was in, uh, in uh, Northern California. Nice spot. And then Rusty says, I remember my first SCA. Really, Anaheim was your first one? 
I thought you'd been long. I thought it'd been longer. Anyway, I drank anything and everything served to me. I felt I had a caffeine. <laughs> you know, actually, for me, the most difficult. The difficult one was in 2007. It was my first trip to Africa, to Ethiopia. And I was invited to do the Taste of Harvest for Ethiopia. And so I was cupping with, uh, with Dwayne Sorensen from uh, Stumptown and Mane Alves from, uh, from Artisan up in uh, Vermont. And these guys are like, by this point, you know, in 2000, they're, they're well seasoned, well respected guys. And so, and I'm cupping with them and, you know, they're, Especially uh, Dwayne is an old buddy of mine, and uh, that day we cupped 75 coffees. 75 coffees, five samples each. So it was... I'll run that calculation. It was 375 samples of coffee. I tasted every one. Now, of course, I'm spitting. But even when you spit and you do that many coffees, man, you just feel, you, I felt wrecked. I really did. I was really warped that, that day. So yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. But I remember my first SCA was actually in Boston in 2003. And I was really, really new to the business because I only got into coffee as, as a coffee, you know, selling it was in 2002. So by 2003, I went to SCA Boston. And it was just an overwhelming experience. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? Like, you just don't understand what's happening. And everything is crazy. And I remember I watched, I, I was walking through the halls and I found this thing where they were doing the barista competitions. And, I, and they were like, they, were do, they do things with the barista competitions, like the, the competitor will serve their drink. And then the MC will be like, all right, let's hear an applause for their cappuccino. And everyone's applauding. And I was like, this is the weirdest, most bizarre, strange, and stupid thing that I've ever seen. A year later, I'm fully immersed. <laughs> like by 2004, we're competing, we're well involved, we're volunteering, you know, we're judging, we're doing all kinds of stuff. And like, yeah, yeah, you really get sucked in. It's, it's really, it's really kind of crazy. Who would you suggest to follow? Seven Mile Australia also, but you know, to be honest with you, Nick, I don't really follow too many people. I, I, don't, I actually don't really follow anyone in coffee on YouTube. And not because I don't like them. I mean, a lot of people that I, that I that you talk about, like Hoffman, I've known for a very long time. Baca, I've known since Baca got into the business. Um, but I don't really watch a lot of their videos, mainly because I'm trying not to be too influenced by what they're putting out. So I don't want to do a video that's, that's similar to what they're doing. Just because I, I just don't want to necessarily seem too, like I want to offer people a different viewpoint. You know, and not just one that's that's always the same, right? So that that's that's really the main reason why I don't really see too many. I'll see some of James' videos, like the one that he did about the bribe. That's kind of funny. And then, of course, I'll listen to Baca's uh, Cat and Cloud podcast every once in a while. But who who else do I, would I follow? You know who I do like? Like if I was to if I was gonna follow someone, which I don't, I do enjoy what um, what Tim Wendelbo has to say. Like Tim and I have been buddies for a long time, and. Like, I'll go hang out with him whenever we're in the same city. Usually him and I work together for a cigar. He likes Cubans. Oh, I like Cubans too, but... But I, that, that's really... It, it's that I don't want to... I'm just trying not to be too influenced by what other people are doing in YouTube, in the sphere, but a lot of them I'll still talk to on a regular basis. <laughs> you know, I had that same feeling... One year, uh, this is many years ago now, but we went up to, myself and Nick Cho and a couple of the guys, um, uh oh, Ryan, the guy that owns a Peregrine Espresso in DC, we all flew up to, uh, to Boston one day because we wanted to go see George Howell. And George kind of gave us this, his private tour and he gave us his private lecture and he's telling us all about coffee, he's telling us all this dropping all this knowledge and science on us. And I just remember sitting there thinking, oh my God, I'm forgetting half of what he's saying. So, <laughs> so I get it, I get it. And it, it's, it's, it, there's a lot, there's a lot to learn. There's so much to learn. And, and here's the interesting thing, like, I don't know if you're involved in the same forums that I, I read on Facebook, but like, you know, there's a lot of pontificating that goes on by a lot of people in, 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 in about espresso and coffee. And, 
And I have to say that earlier in my career, I was definitely one of those people that was very much like, it has to be this way, it's this and that. And, you know, these are the ultimatums and these are the absolutes. But the longer that I've been in the business, the more that I've learned, the less, the less narrow, hardcore I've become. Like now it's like, well, like somebody was asking today about, well, what kind of machine should I buy? I've got this budget of, you know, under a you know, under thousand, the 300 to a thousand, but I would prefer to stay at the lower end. And my response was, you know what? And this is something that guys that will, 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 will uh, is related to the guys that watch the show also, is that I said to her, you know what? Here's something for you to consider. It's like, if you want to stay within the lower point of your price range, and I would suggest getting the, considering the Gaggio Brera, which is a super automatic machine. And I said, you know, because some of my friends, one of my friends has the, the precursor to the Gaggio Brera, and that's Bud. Bud has this older Gaggio. I forgot the name of the model. And, you know, it's about $500, $459 for the, the Brera. And it's a super automatic, which a lot of people in the business or a lot of people in, in the home espresso world will poo-poo on. But really, it's like I kind of think that, you know, you have to look at what your budget is, look at what you want to achieve, and look at what's good for you. And, like, you could easily spend tens of thousands. It's like, you know, the lever that, that's in the video that Greg has, that's a $14,000 machine without the grinder. And that grinder that we're using, the EG1 from Weber or the, uh, the EK43 from Malconi, they're both, what, $3,500? So, I mean, you're, sp you're talking about nearly $20,000. You could buy, like, a nice Lexus, I think, for that kind of money. And, or at least a, a Kia Soul and a bunch of accessories. And, you know, you could spend that kind of money, but you don't necessarily need to, especially if your needs are not, or, and demands are not that high. So, but I do think that the Gaggio, even though, even though it's got its limitations and it, maybe it can't do quite the espresso that, that we can achieve like on, on the bigger machines, it does deliver a nice coffee. And I think you can crank it down and get some nice crema and some nice flavor out of it. Not Tim. Yeah, Tim's a sharp guy. You know, I do. He's a good guy. Him and I always argue about roast profiles. Like, you know, he's very much into the Nordic style, right? The light roast. And I'm not really about that. I'm more about the older school, like the older third wave school where it's, it's a lot more mild reaction, a lot more development, a lot more, you know, medium. We're more medium roast, right? Like, we're bring it right to the edge of second crack, where Tim is kind of like closer to first crack. But, you know, it's good times. Good times with that guy. Oh, yes. Well, sprocoffee.com. We got it on the, online. We'll send it out to you. We typically roast about once a week. So depending on when our roast day falls and when you order, it may take a little bit longer to get to, but we, we, we roast it fresh and then package it and then send it out. So we're, here we are into the final third, well into the final third, like we're rolling towards the end and it's only 9.30. <laughs> Crazy, but good, good. Do I have two or five pound bags? Yes, 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 we can, we can certainly do that. Better yet, just drop me an email. Is that the best way to do it? If you're not on Facebook, yeah, drop me an email or message, actually better yet, message me on Instagram because I don't really check email anymore. I've kind of tr been trying to wean myself. I, well, I have a wean, like I started in 2018 and I just have this message that's on my email account that just pops up whenever you, whenever you spend, send an email to it that says I no longer check email. And so if you send an email to me, it takes a, long, a lot longer to respond. But drop me an, a message on IG, on Instagram, at uh, Ono Coffee, O-N-O Coats Coffee. And, um, yeah, we could talk more about it and put that together for it. Because I don't really I don't think on the website we have, because typically two and five pound or five pound bags is really how we ship it to, uh, or that's how we supply our wholesale counts. We don't really have that on the, on the retail side. But we could certainly put that together for you. But, oh, you know who I do watch you? It's just, 
I do see Wolfram. So if you look at Backyard Coffee on YouTube, Wolfram is there. But the problem with Wolfram is that he, it's all of his videos for Backyard are in German. So I'm always just kind of trying to watch the translation. It's, it takes, but you know, and the nice thing about Wolfram is that whenever him and I hang out, like I'll go visit him and, and we'll hang out at, at, his, uh, at his roastery. And he's always got some like science that he's going on about coffee. And it's really kind of interesting stuff. And then I'm always like, oh, every time I'm hanging out, every time I visit him, he's like, tell me what they're working on. I'm always like, oh, that's something to really think about. And also if you, if you go there, if you're a jujitsu fan, he's also a big jujitsu. He's a Gracie jujitsu guy, and he's so into it. Like, he built a jujitsu uh, ring, ring, dojo, in his roastery. So you can roast coffee and practice jujitsu at his place. It's really quite interesting. Maybe that's the video we should do together. Is like jujitsu, which I, that was probably not good for me, man. Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. So rolling along, still very enjoyable. Like this is quite, quite nice. Like I, I'm actually surprised. I wasn't sure what to, to expect. Like I, I've had the Oscar, the Leaf by Oscar a couple times and I remember them being, you know, nice, but they were never like, standouts in my mind as far as like you know like if i see them in the stores like I, am i really going to buy one when there's other stuff available like if if there's roma there or tatuaje or aladino or illusione i'll probably go to those first like i wouldn't choose oscar over them but this is quite enjoyable like it doesn't have that you know what the like a lot of the guys that, that watch you know there's a lot we, we like a lot of the romas the heavier more forceful cigars this is not that this is definitely lighter it's more medium um it's not terribly nuanced and complex like when you if i was to compare it to say like the pdr sp54 the um the box pressed siri pravada or the pg bellicos maduro it doesn't have that level of complexity right it does it's not that it's a very simple approachable cigar with a great draw and great build and great burn. Maybe I should send my brother to that because I think, yes, jujitsu would, me being thrown over to land on my back would probably be a bad thing. Like, it might make for a very entertaining YouTube video, but it may take a year to make because I'd probably get injured and then have to be in the hospital for quite a long time and then then I could finally get to editing it. But yeah, I look forward to going to Germany again to, to at least see what we could do there. Yeah, this, this brewing of the, of the Aeropress was not, I had to play with that more. So Nick, you might not have seen this on the earlier part, but there are people that, that, that talk about doing the AeroPress as a pour over. So eliminating using the top part of it and just using the bottom as a brewing. Uh, you can kind of see it in there. So we did that earlier and brewed, brewed it over ice to make iced coffee. And not bad, but I, I think that we need to work on the proper grind right for it. <laughs> Yes, yes, that guy being thrown over would be very entertaining. Especially to see, especially for my detractors, they would be, they would love to see me get worked. <laughs> All right, so I guess the big thing that we always ask, that Rusty wants to know, that we always ask, is would I buy it again? This cigar. I have to say, yeah, yeah, I would, I would. This is something I would buy again. It's it's a little bit pricey. Like for example, the real world price here in Maryland at, at Tobacco Leaf is twelve dollars. So it's right at the edge of what I would spend. So it does it. So if I wanted a cigar that was good, enjoyable, well made, yes. But at twelve dollars, hmm, that's a good question. You know, there's so many cigars that I enjoy at 
either at this price point or a little bit less. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, the MSRP is at 1050. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, maybe. maybe yeah, yeah, I would say yes. It's worth buying, worth trying out. But I do, I do have some reservations about the whole Superfly name. You know, like what does that really mean? Is it more black exploitation? Especially since the the label is very black exploitative, right? That Superfly style. And so Nick says, I never tried the airport. You should give it a try. It's 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 not bad. We use a, a, a little bit. Oh, sorry about that. We use a little bit of a different um, method where we do the inverted style, but we're using 36 grams of, of finely ground coffee and um, adding the water, about four ounces of water, letting it stir and, and steep for about 45 to 55 seconds, and then pressing. And then that ratio of 36 grams to the four ounces of water, we're actually gonna, that's actually a, oops, that's actually a, a, what do you call it? A, oh goodness, let me get rid of that. That is actually a concentration because it's, um, we're, really, we're really ratioing it for a 12 ounce cup because we're, we actually use the AeroPress in our shop as, as a means to deliver a, a regular coffee. Close to espresso, Brian? Yeah, yeah, not, not terribly espresso, but definitely like if you're using a, a regular like bean grinder that's not exactly calibrated, that, that's more calibrated to brewing rather than calibrated for espresso, then definitely on the finer side. Espresso grind might be too fine for that. And then Tony says, I should find a sumo stunt double. I should find that. Actually, doing a sumo video would be kind of nice next time I go to Japan. That's something I would like to see as a, as a, as a tournament there. But every time I've been in Tokyo, it's never the right time of year. Like, my understanding is that Tokyo has sumo tournaments during a particular time of the year, and then the rest of the year, either they're training or they're doing tournaments in other parts of the country. And so I've never been in in Tokyo at the right time. But I've been, I've, but I've walked by the places, of the, the arena, because it's actually, um, I get this, I get my. You cut that from this place that's actually in that district. Which probably tells you the only place that sells a yukata for a guy like me is in the sumo territories. <laughs> so we're really down, down to the end here. Yeah, the idea for this, this, this pour over style AeroPress, I got from some of the guys on the forums that I read, they talk about doing this. So I was like, oh, that sounds strange, but interesting. So I, I wanted to give it a try today. Yeah, it's, it's, this brew was, was nice. It's light. And the coffee that I'm using is our Perla Negra, which is a, a coffee grown for us by the Mirish family. And it uses a anaerobic fermentation that converts the malic acids to lactic acids because of the low oxygen environment. And it really gives a nice sweet milkiness to the coffee, especially as it cools. So when I first tried that in 2015, I thought that this would make a great coffee for us to use for our cold brew program. And so ever since then, uh, Eliane has been producing it for us as our cold brew coffee. But in this case, it's a little bit on the lighter brews. The brewing is a little bit lighter. So it's a lighter coffee, a little bit more a little bit brighter than than it would be normally. So really for the, the Cobra, we're trying for something a little bit heavier, a little bit of chocolatiness, a little bit more syrupiness, and then with a really nice, like, smooth, sweet, milky character to it. And typically, lately we've been doing the Cobra as in a toddy style method, you know, with a, <coughs> essentially one pound of coffee per gallon of water. And then like an overnight 12 to 16 hour steeping time. Oh, 
All right, so I guess we're going to wrap it up here with this. We're at the very end. And so Nick's asking, what temp do we use for the brew our espresso? So at our shop, we're using La Marzocco Lineas with uh, PID controllers that we installed. So the, on the Linea, the temperature probe for the readout is actually inside the boiler, right? And so the, if you're familiar with the La Marzocco, it's got these um, group heads that are, are, are fully saturated, what they call them. And so basically off the boiler, there's an extension to the group head that is filled with water and the, it all surrounds it. However, there is an offset in temperature between the group head water and the, the boiler water. So we actually set our, our PIDs to hold the temperature of the, the water temperature inside the brew boiler, in the center of the brew boiler, to be about 206 degrees, which then translate into uh, water that comes out about right around 198. And so that's pretty much where we have our set. All right, so I guess that's going to be it. We've got to the end of our cigar here. I'm going to put it down now. This is the Oscar Valladora Superfly Toro. Nice cigar. Well made. Burns beautifully. Draws beautifully. The flavor has a, it's a nice kind of like tobacco, general tobacco flavor with a, a brightness to it. The, the sweet, the tobacco is sweet, and then there's this like nice bright acidicness to the on the tongue it's relatively static throughout the entire cigar it's not one that changes and not one that gets terribly dynamic uh, not really a lot of nuances there's not a lot of complexity it's just kind of straightforward but very enjoyable yeah man anytime no problem thanks for watching yeah and so that's gonna be it thank you all for watching really appreciate you spending us the Thursday with me here and um, next week what are we doing next week uh oh let me see here. What are we doing next week? My show notes tonight are a little bit spread out, so I have to look around here. Next week, we're doing the Hoya de Nicaragua Silver Toro, and uh, that's made by, of course, Hoya de Nicaragua in, in Esteli by the, the Cuenca family. And, um, yeah, that's what we're going to be doing next week. And the interesting thing is that, especially, at, well, maybe I'll remember to talk about this then, the, um, this is a 54 Toro. The silver, and I'll, I'll talk more about this next week, but the silver, while it's also tor is actually quite thinner, like dramatically thinner. So I was really surprised at that. Thank you, Rusty, for coming in tonight. And Bud and Tony and everybody. So I guess that's going to be it. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll be back again next Thursday. Really appreciate you spending the time with me. Have a great night. <laughs>